Um, I've gotten a little chance to get to know him. He's very quiet and very reserved, but from what I can tell, <laughs> it, he has been with me anyway. <laughs> but from what I can tell, he's very w loved in AA, and he's very well known. And evidently, he has a really awesome story. So I can't wait to hear it tonight. Please come up, Chris. We got her fooled. <laughs> My name is Chris Raymer. I'm a very grateful recovered alcoholic. Man, this is like like talking at your home group. You know, I know so many of y'all in this room. Some of you guys I've known for years, and uh, some of you I thought was dead. You know what I mean? You hear? Uh, and here you are. That's a pretty cool thing. I, I'm honored uh, to to be here. Uh, nice digs, huh? The, the last area conference I talked at was at a Motel 6. In, in, um, Y'all think I'm kidding. It was, it was, this is nice. I, um, I got to tell you, flying in, I, I flew into Hobby and, and uh, uh, Sarah picked me up and I'm, I'm seeing all these, I don't see well anyway, and I, but I'm seeing all these blue panels on these roofs, and I'm thinking, you know, God, Houston has just become so green. That's all these solar panels on these roofs. <laughs> but they're all blue. You know, they, and we're laying, and we're getting closer to the hobby, and I look down and said, they're tarps. You know, I mean, I, I, it freaks me out that there was that much damage done during that hurricane. I just, who knew? Uh, so if you're living under a tarp, uh, my hat's off to you, and welcome, and Sorry. It's tough. I, uh, uh, I, uh, I nearly died getting to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I got sober in 1987, finally. I went to my first meeting um, up in North Texas uh, in the early 80s and, uh, and didn't get sober. Of course, I was seven years in and out, and I want to talk a little bit about that. But I'm, I'm pretty passionate about recovery, and I, I love Alcoholics Anonymous, and I... I, uh, I work at a hospital. I've worked at a treatment center. I've done clerical work there for about 15 years. I know some of y'all from that hospital, and it's so good to see you. And it's, um, I, uh, I've heard just about every, uh, but you don't understand, my case is a different story <laughs> that there could possibly ever be. And, and I, uh, this is the piece I want to say, and I'm, I'm going to try to go really slow tonight. Because I'm, I'm catching, I've been speaking from the podium for 20, 20 years, guys, and I, I'm catching such a bad rap from the, from the sign language people, you know, because I, I talk real fast, and I mean, I just do. I, I do everything kind of fast, and everything. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to try to go slow, but if I, if I, uh, y'all catch me, that's what I'm doing. I, um. Uh, I need to say this real quick before I go in the door because I, I don't want to get any grindy with anybody. I know some of y'all have heard CDs of mine and you kind of know where I'm coming from and some of y'all have never heard me before and, and, you, and you're, you're going to be maybe a little concerned with this talk uh, because, I'm, because I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty focused on the solution. I'm a big book thumper. I'm, I, I'm, I believe the big book means what it says and says what it means. And it, and it, yeah, thank you. And I got to, and I mean, I, if, if if you're a thumper too, you're gonna love this talk. You'll be okay. And I, I, I say this everywhere I speak. I, I'm in Europe. Uh, you know, we were in Sweden. Myers and I were a lot longer we were in Sweden, and, and I said the same thing there because I don't want anybody coming up after the meeting grindy because you, my story doesn't match with yours. I've never understood that. Why does my story have to match with yours in order to convey any kind of a message? My sponsor said, maybe, maybe you're going to hear something that you like and something you don't like, but either way, next time you get a chance to get up there and then you get to say it. And so, Why am I taking so much time to do this? Is because I'm fixing to step on some of you. And I, and, I'm, and I just want you to know it. It's just come purely from my heart. I don't, I don't want to I don't want to offend anybody. I just... I just um, I feel a, a real sense of responsibility, especially at a service conference like this. I feel a, a real sense of, of, of responsibility towards our fellowship, towards Alcoholics Anonymous. 
because it's the only game in town. I told you that I worked at a hospital. I do clerical work, and I get a chance to do some big book work with the patients sometimes, and I get a chance to talk to a lot of them. And I, and I know one thing, and I know one thing quite clearly. The patients that leave that hospital, nice hospital, high dollar, leave that hospital, come back to an area like this and get hooked up in, in a good group and, and get connected to some good sponsorship, they stay sober. The people that don't, don't stay sober. I think treatment's a wonderful thing. I think it's a great springboard into recovery. Great place to get good and detox. Great place to bounce off. But re- <laughs> treatment centers are not recovery. AA's recovery. This, is, this world is recovery out here. And that's what this is about. And so... Um, the simple fact that I introduced myself as a recovered alcoholic from the podium I know sets some of your teeth on edge because your sponsor told you different or your counselor told you different. We're just amazing to people as far as I'm concerned in those areas. It's, we're so, we're so, we, we, try, we say we're open-minded, but we're not. We're the most closed-minded SOBs I think I've ever known. You know. <laughs> well, my counselor up at the hospital said that we will always be recovering. Your, your counselor was wrong. book says you can recover. My book says you can recover. My experience shows that for 21 years I haven't obsessed about alcohol. This thing we're talking about is power, real power. And you're either going to get connected to it or you're not. And I'm not up here going to mince any words tonight about it. This thing is about God. It's about a spiritual experience. If you don't like that, man, right now would be a great time to go get some coffee and a good smoke. <laughs> Rock on. i got to tell you real quick. Uh, my, uh, my, tw- my twin brother, I have an identical twin brother here. We're going to do a deal on, on sponsorship in the morning. And, um, and, I've, and I've heard all of the jokes already. So I don't even, does he wear a patch on the other eye? And, <laughs> oh, God. I, it's, it's, you're, it's amazing. It's, you're so amusing. And uh, no, but he's, uh, he's uh, 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 great sobriety in his own right and speaks as much as I do out there in, in the pub. He's from Dallas, Texas and in that area. And um, uh, Anyway, 9 o'clock in the morning, we're going to do a sponsorship deal. So if you see him, the reason I'm mentioning this is because got some of these little guys that are brand new. You know how they're new because they've got these little things they're asking us to sign and they're looking a little bewildered, like they're not quite detoxed yet. You know, it's like, mm, mm, mm. It's, there's two of us here and we do look a lot alike, so back off. Back off. Okay. I'm the real McCoy. I introduced myself as a recovered alcoholic, and I need to tell you, Bill Wilson talked a lot about being the real McCoy, being the real alcoholic. He uses that term over and over in the first few chapters. And a lot of you guys, you get get tweaky about that. Well, I'm an alcoholic if I say I'm an alcoholic. It's absolute rubbish. You're a member of Alcoholics Anonymous if you say you're a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. But you know, guys, there's certain symptoms you've got to have in order to be an alcoholic. Now, you can call yourself a freaking duck for all I care. It doesn't make you one. Y'all, y'all follow? I'm the real McCoy. I qualify by the definition of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've got a phenomena. Y'all with us? Welcome. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> I've got a phenomena called craving. I've got a, a physical wiring that's different. Myers and I, we could go start to drink, and it would be our intention to have a couple of cocktails and then hit the, hit the dance floor. And, and uh, Myers and I would have a couple of cocktails, and we would not hit any dance floor uh, unless we were face forward on it. You know what I'm saying? We would, we, 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 we would be drinking, you know? I've got a little sister, bless her heart. We've talked about her from the podium a million times. I, I guess I owe her amends. But she's so not one of us. We're raised in the same family. She has a couple of drinks. She has like maybe one. Lisa, you want another drink? Even at her own wedding. We, it freaked me out, Lisa. We, this booze is paid for. <laughs> you can... You can you can have all you want. And she says, no, thank you. I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> I, it's, I've been telling that story for 21 years, and it still makes me laugh every time I think, you don't, me too. I'm, do you want another drink or not? Because I don't understand that answer to the question. You know? No, she's having the experience that normal people have. 
You know, so that's when these guys come to treatment. We spend, we spend hours with them when they first get there doing a psych social and all this and all the history and how many DWIs and how many of this. We need to ask them one simple question. Did you ever puke drinking? <laughs> yeah. Second two-part question. Did you ever do it again? <laughs> yeah. Here's you a big book. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know? Because... <laughs> You know, because nor- normal people don't do that. But here's the deal. You combine that thing with a thing called the obsession of the mind, the mental obsession from page 23 to 43. These pages talk about it. If we got any family members in here, and I hope we do, and you're kind of confused about this thing about alcoholism, read those pages because those pages talk about the mental insanity. Any idiot... Even- I mean, even Oprah understands the physical allergy. You know, I mean, the, the dullest the doctor I ever knew understood that. Well, you little alcoholics, once you start, you have a tough time quitting, don't you? God, brilliant. How, how did you figure that out yourself, you know? It's just pretty obvious with us. But the mental obsession is where the room scatters. You follow? Even, even in our own fellowship. My book says on page 24, I've lost the power of choice in drink. One of my jobs as a sponsor is to help the newcomer find out if they've lost the power of choice in drink. But I can take you to a meeting tonight in Houston, Texas, where there's an old geezer that'll start his talk with, I got up this morning and chose not to drink. Rock on, brother. Good for you. You ain't an alcoholic. Man, I can't choose to stop. I can choose. I think I'm, I'm choosing to stop. And then my head says, the further away I get from the drink, this internal discomfort starts to percolate. And usually with me in a couple of weeks, my head's saying, you, you could probably just drink one. <laughs> and here we go. You with me? Right now, rampant all over the country, what people are hearing is, you could try some of that Lanesta. Some of you aren't laughing. You're taking it, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Let me, I don't care if your doctor gave it to you or not. You're fixing to go back to treatment. We're, we've got a hospital full of people relapsing around that stuff. But understand, why are we taking these pills? You know what the largest prescribed medication on earth is? <laughs> no. Nah. She said Xanax. No. Nah. Nah. Largest prescribed medication on earth, largest prescribed medication on earth is antidepressants. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. Man, we're looking for a pill to fix this internal discomfort. But you see what happens is I've got this mental obsession, a delusional thinking, coupled with the spiritual malady, this internal discomfort, that guarantees that I will look for some relief sooner or later. That's what was so frustrating for me. I was a functioning alcoholic, guys. I spent a lot of my drinking here. I went to an apprenticeship program here in Houston as a cook for a long time. I worked at the Warwick Hotel for a long time. The old, I saw it when we were coming in. and It's, just, it's, it's like I can stop or moderate for short periods of time. As this disease progresses, though, it's less and less likely that I can do that. That's why we see so many people. There's, there's, there was a little guy sitting in my uh, in a, the treatment center where I work, and he's sitting in there this morning with eyes you know, like deer in a headlight, like, what the hell happened? You know, and he's 55 years old. He managed to hold it together pretty good, and now all of a sudden the disease has progressed far enough. Now it's, it's just got, it's like one day he was doing okay. You know, guys, I held it together really good until I didn't. You follow? That's the grinder, folks. Now, if you can reel it back in and control it and moderate, the book says you're not one of us. But I have experience. What's your truth based on your experience that I can't do that? That's why alcoholics die, folks. And I'm just going to say this and move on. I want to tell you a little bit about my story. There's a thousand different ways to get to this path. I know a lot of you guys, some of you come from treatment. And some of you just walked in the back doors like I did finally in an AA meeting. And some of you guys have come through, through, through counselors or therapists. I don't know, but I'm just telling you this. If you're really one of us, I want to make sure that you get to hear the solution as outlined in the big book. You, know, you can put any spin on it you want. Bill Wilson said the further away you get from the, the message out of this book, the less likely you are that you're going to have success. He said it. I didn't. Our experience abundantly confirms it. You, you follow? 
In other words, if you're one of these guys that meeting makers make it, and I've been to a meeting every day for the last 50 years and I've been sober, rock on. But you know, I sat in meetings for seven years and did hundreds of meetings and drank. And my experience is that meetings don't treat alcoholism. And if you think they do, you can come up afterwards and we can have a chat about it if you want to. But I know where in the book does it say going to a meeting will fix what's wrong with me. People get these CDs all over the world. They say, Chris, you're knocking meetings. Guys, I love meetings. Everything I have in this world I owe to Alcoholics Anonymous. Everybody I've got in the world is in AA, is in my fellowship, in my home group, in my club. I, I, I'm, not, I'm the last one to knock a meeting. But we got too many people being given crappy, crappy, crappy advice. Well, just go to meetings. Just go to meetings and don't drink and everything will be okay. I'm just saying, if you can just go to meetings and not drink, you're, you may not be one of us. Because my book says on, on, on a dozen pages, but it says it on page 45, 44, 45, lack of power is the dilemma. On the preceding page it says, i got to have, if I'm the real McCoy, a spiritual experience. My spiritual experience, thank God, is going to be different than yours. We all get our own unique spiritual experience. But you're going to have one. And I, and I, don't, want to, I, don't, want to, I don't want to water this down to a place where you think you can do this without the spiritual experience. It's a cop-out. Shauna just read the, uh, the fifth tradition we were talking about. I mean, that's where it comes from, this whole idea. We have one... 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 Make it, hold it up high, baby. One primary purpose, and that's to carry the message of hope to the newcomer. The message of hope comes out of the big book. The message of hope is the 12 steps. Can you learn some other cool stuff in the fellowship? You better believe it. I learned to balance a checkbook in the fellowship. But that's not our... It's a good thing. But early on, that wasn't what was killing me. Early on, my disconnection from a, from, from a power greater than myself was what was killing me. Y'all follow? So I just think there's a sense of urgency. I know everybody gets here a little bit different, but uh, let's make sure that the newcomer, whether he wants it or not, gets to hear the solution. And then if they go out and they want to experiment another six years, they can come back and at least know where the solution is. We, we, I want to just take this opportunity to unapologetically, unapologetically say that this is about God. No bones to pick with that. Myers and I were raised in the hill country down in, uh, down in Kerrville. I bet, you, I bet you there's 40 of you that have summer homes in Kerrville. Because every, every house in there on the hill is owned by somebody from Houston, Texas. That's a real fact. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. That place is still growing. And it's all, all people from, from this side of the I-10. And they... Um, uh, Mom's a professional artist, and she's still kicking. My father and uh, was a printer, and I mean, we had a great life, great home. There was no goofy stuff going on, uh, uh, except we were in it. You know, I mean, we just <laughs> my, my my father drank, and uh, and my mom didn't, and um, we started drinking in high school and never looked back. And uh, about the time we got a uh, Myers bought an old Volkswagen, it wasn't old, it was damn near new, and we moved to Houston, Texas, packed it up, and there was, I think, six of us in that Volkswagen. We all moved to Houston at the same time. And, uh, uh, and I got a job at the Houston Oaks in an apprenticeship program and was pretty successful. He got a job tending and bar, and um, life was good. <laughs> I drank free, and he ate free, and, we were, and it was just rock and roll. And, uh, and for a long time, guys, about 19 years in there, we were what we would call functioning alcoholics. We were, we were not going to jail. We were not robbing liquor stores, but we were having moments when it was really, really not working for us. And uh, those are the moments that the big book talks about. Uh, I picked up the phone book to call an AA meeting when I was 21 years old, uh, living in Houston. And uh, I didn't call AA, but I picked up the phone book, looked up the number. You know, I'm, my heart was in the right place. Because I had a hangover from hell, and I knew I was a problem, and I knew my father had had a problem, and, and, and I understood somebody had explained something one time about a genetic predisposition, so I figured I was off to the races. So anyway... Um, we're messing around, and I start some geographic. Uh, I moved to Atlanta. Uh, I moved to uh, Austin. That was great with Mom. You know, she, she lent me money so I could move to Austin so I could get sober. That was a great experiment there because <laughs> there's no alcohol in Austin, Texas. 
I learned how to dip and drink long necks in Austin, Texas. And, you know, guys, like, again, it was, there was periods of time when alcohol was working, and then it would get to a spot where it stopped working. And it was just really, really tough at those points. The depression's starting to kick my butt, and I'm starting to see a counselor and a therapist. Uh, in the uh, late 70s, I discovered some outside issues, and uh, right soon thereafter, I started seeing a therapist real hard, and a doctor started prescribing medications for me. And this was... Um, um, Thank God I had them. I, I, I catch a bad rap. People think I'm knocking meds. I'm not. I'm glad I had them. I just don't think I needed seven of them. But I... But I, <laughs> I, I don't know. There used to be an antidepressant suppository. Now, now I need to tell you... <laughs> You've got to want to get sober bad, guys, to do some of the stuff that we do. You know? They got, they got a deal out right now. Did you see it on the news the other night? They had another resurgence of the Whizinator. You know, you can buy this little plastic jock strap with a little plastic pee-pee on it so that you can beat the, a pee test for the probation officers. And I'm, I'm sitting there doing this in a lecture. The guy says, yeah, yeah, they're $150. I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, it's like, well, given sufficient reason, I don't have to pee out of a little plastic jock strap. Can you, you follow? Oh, man, why am I holding on to my right to continue to drink? Because every once in a while, guys, that alcohol will make me okay inside. The irritableness, the restlessness, and the discontent, and the depression, and the low self-esteem will all go away, and it are good. Our family members ask, why do you drink? You're puking your guts up in the morning. You're, you're causing all this problem. Why do you drink? Because my mind always goes back to the time when I took a couple of drinks, and I walked up to the best-looking girl in the place and said, Hey, baby. How about me and you and the Camara leaving this joint? And, and she said no, but there was a moment. <laughs> but there was a moment when she almost said yes. So, we always remember the time that it worked for us, buddies, and that's what people don't understand. Our families just think we're, we're avoiding reality. You don't understand. When I drink, I get right in the middle of reality. I get right in. You're running from life. No, I am life. When I'm drinking, all of y'all understand, I'm right in the middle of this. When it's working, and then the crap stops working, now I'm in trouble. You with us? I moved to Denton and got married to a nice girl here in, in uh, Houston. And uh, she's back here in Houston, and I understand, and very nice. There was nothing wrong with her, but there was, I guarantee you, I, I blamed her for everything that was ever going bad in my life. And, uh, and I'm still steady drinking. And I'm seeing the therapist. And we're talking to the counselors are all trying to help me. We give the counselors such a bad deal. You know, we, we never tell them the truth. Chris, have you been drinking? A little. <laughs> How much? A couple. We didn't tell them about all those other outside issues we were doing at the same time. We didn't tell them about any of that. And they're trying to help me figure out. We talk about all the stuff. Um, we talked about Vietnam until the cows come home because I'm a guy of the 60s and 70s. And we talked a lot about it. I've never been to Vietnam, but we talked a lot about it. <laughs> That's the big laugh with us. We talked a lot about me being gay. And I've got to tell you guys, that was a conversation with every therapist I ever had. Chris, we need to really research this, this sexual stuff, this... Your, your relationships, I mean, because they're trying to connect the dot. What's up here, you know? And so it's like, I, I am so not gay. But, you know, we... <laughs> but I so wanted to be, you know, if, if I could... <laughs> no, guys, it's the same thing. Chris, you're diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but I'm not bipolar. You're manic depressive, but I'm not manic depressive. You're adult attention deficit disorder, but I'm not. I'm not. I wanted to be because that was the that was the that was the pill that was going to fix what's wrong with me. If I can connect it to that, then oh, you're Chris. You're not an alcoholic. You're 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 borderline schizophrenic. Oh, hot damn. Okay, no wonder. <laughs> I got it now. Rock on. Here's a little pill that'll fix that. Oh. I uh, had a little domestic disturbance with the little, uh, the little wifey up in North Texas. I ended up going to work for a, a chef that was also a drug dealer, and uh, uh, I didn't know that at the time. And uh, we, 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 we almost drank ourselves to death. And uh, I, uh, uh, because of that little domestic disturbance, I promised that I would go to uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. I need to tell you this. I, I, I try to do it every time I speak from the podium, make sure that you all understand where I'm coming from. Uh, I know that... Alcoholics catch a bad rap. There's people say it from the podium all the time. Well, you know, if an alcoholic mouse moving, he's lying. 
You know, I find that really disrespectful because uh, it's not the truth. Uh, there are times I have lied. Uh, and there's times I've looked at somebody that I loved and cared for and, and told them point blank that I would never touch another drink. And I thought I had the power to do that. And that was the confusion for me in Alcoholics Anonymous because I'm hearing people tell me that I can choose not to. If you really, really want to, you can quit. If you can quit because you want to, if you can quit because you need to, you're not one of us. Go away. (laughs) And I say that jokingly, but I'm only half joking because y'all are the ones that are taking exception with the stuff that the big book thumpers are saying. And that's that's what drives me crazy. Anyway, I, uh, uh, I went to Alcoholics Anonymous in the early 80s and started going up in Denton, Texas. Nice place, nice guys. And I went to my first AA meeting, and an old geezer was laying back in an easy chair in, uh, in a room with one little light. Looked like the light from Psycho, you know. Ur, 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 ur. You think I'm kidding. It freaked me out. And you can smell dead roaches in there, and it's like... And, and I walked up to a deal like this, and, he, and I re- got my eyes all kind of adjusted. Y'all remember... There used to be a bar here in Houston called Marfrelis. What was it? Mar- is it still that Marfrelis? But it's one of those places where you would walk in and you had to stop and let your eyes get adjusted like a raccoon, you know, before you could move, you know, because you could. It was so dark in that bar, and I, and I was there once. They say. I remember the darkness. I don't just don't remember where it was. But anyway, that's exactly what this AA meeting was like in this room. And I walked in, and it was real dark. And, it, and, this, and, this, and, this, and I wrecked up. My eyes got accustomed, and there was three or four people in the room. And this old geezer sitting in the easy chair, and he kind of sat forward. He says, welcome. Do you have a desire to stay sober? I said, yeah. Yeah. I'm drunk. I mean, I, I got a quart of beer in a truck, and I mean, I've been drinking all afternoon. He said, do you have a desire to stay sober? And I said, yeah. He said, welcome. Welcome. That's the closest that anyone came to qualifying me for membership in Alcoholics Anonymous for seven years. Unbelievable. And then we got in there and we sat down and we started talking and everybody went around the room and they introduced themselves in this cryptic way we do. Last initial. And then we told a few war stories and some lady was having trouble with her husband so we spent the rest of the hour talking about her husband. Rock on. And I left, and, the, and my wife was waiting for me afterwards, and she said, how did it go? And I said, it's pretty cool. You know, we, we talked about uh, stuff, and, and this guy's, this lady's husband, and, and I think I'm going to go back someday. <laughs> Guys, and I spent the next seven years. I mean, I don't care where I'm speaking. This is the stuff that gets me in trouble because I can't not talk about it. It's like I know that you love those kind of meetings. You walked in and they shared from the heart about their life and, and they just had me from the beginning. You didn't. You scared the bejesus out of me. All you did was tell war story after war story and I couldn't understand because I've never had a DWI and I've never blacked out and I've never robbed a liquor store and I've never chopped anybody up. And this piss and pants stuff, I don't know nothing about. I eventually did some of that. I need to tell you that. Not the chopping people up part. (laughs) Bill Wilson wrote a lot about this, guys. He wrote a lot about this. Dr. Bob wrote a lot about this. We told war stories in a 12-step call. If I'm sitting down 12-stepping you, I'm going to share some stories with you so I can get your attention so that you can know exactly what Bill and Bob did in their first meeting. They sat there for a few minutes and they talked about the, their, their history and their stories and they identified and then Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob started talking about the solution. You with me? Bill Wilson snagged him. Everybody wants to take... God, to just we should see the emails I get from this. All we have is our stories. You're sitting there telling us that we don't... Listen, if all I have is my stupid stories of eating out of dumpsters out of here off South Post Oak, shame on me. I've been sober 21 years. How about that part of my story? I had a, I had a spiritual experience that changed me at a cellular level. How about that part of my story? But I'm never going to get a chance to tell the newcomer that because we're too busy trying to scare them into these rooms with these stupid stories. You go do a 12-step call out there in the coffee room and you see if they're interested in getting sober and then we come in here and we pull them with a vision. That's what we're supposed to do. And about this, this junior therapy stuff, 
The book is crystal clear. It's not in giving that's in question. It's when and how to give. The minute we start letting that newcomer depend on us, we're doing them a disservice. They need to start depending on the thing called God, that spiritual solution. I, in, in the morning, when we, Myers and I do this sponsorship deal, we're going to talk some about it. I tell you, guys, I, again, I, I've been around a lot of newcomers coming into the fellowship. When they come to that hospital and they find out we're 12-step based and we're all about the big book and God and the spiritual experience, they are so pissed. <laughs> they are mad. Said, oh, no, because they've been to AA. Our problem is not getting cats to come to AA. Our problem is getting them to stay. Why can't they stay? Because they're too tired of listening to you tell your stupid story one more time. We need to get in there at a group level, go to group conscience, and start turning some of these meetings into literature-based meetings where we start talking about the power so we can start pulling the newcomer with a vision. Let me tell you what happened to me. 1987, fast forward, I'm working for my twin brother in a, in a, in a warehouse. In, he owns a book by up in North Texas, and I thank God for family, right? I've been on the street. I couldn't cook anymore. I just couldn't stand that long. I, my hands are shaking, and, uh, and I'm a mess. Oh, my God. I, I got about 40 pounds on me, and it's all right here, and there's kidney damage and liver damage. I go to the doctor. I'm puking blood. I'm not a uh, big full beard down to here, and this patch is always crooked. It's just... <laughs> that's the big joke. They used to call me earmuff because you didn't know if it was... A, Patch is pretty cool if it's on straight, guys, but it's an earmuff. It's not cool, I'm telling you. I don't know. It's right up there with a big old booger in your nose. I can promise you that. And I'm working for my twin brother, but I'm, I'm coming apart. And I, I'm, I'm, we've laughed about it before. I'm just not hitting. You know like in those old movies where the vacancies, no vacancy signs are in the hotel, you know, and it's going, you know, and it kind of comes on, kind of comes off a little bit. That's, that was me. <laughs> some days I'm hitting, some days I'm not. I'm fried, folks. And I'm drinking myself spitless. And the disease is getting worse. Mentally, I can't seem to, to make this thing work. And uh, I've done therapy. And um, I picked up, a, I've done some treatment. I've done outpatient until the cows came home. And I just, I picked up a stack of return checks one night. And uh, uh, it's cold night. With, I don't know. Y'all know how it is. I, I mean, I, it was my intentions at 35 years old to be a responsible member and balance my checkbook and start amassing some things. But I'm, I'm driving an old beat-up pickup truck. About $600 is what it cost me. Uh, I have an apartment simply because my sister-in-law co-signed for that apartment. And, uh, and she's the one that's going to have to help me unsort. She's here tonight. Bless her. I can't even look at her without crying. The crap she pulled me out of in those years. And I'm just done, folks. And I, I got up and I fed the ferrets and... Uh, Everybody needs a pet. I just happened to get the stinkiest pets on earth. <laughs> and I fed the ferrets, and I got up, and I went to the medicine cabinet, and I pulled down some pills and, and drank them down. I, I was just done. And uh, I heard a voice about the time those pills hit my stomach that said, don't do this, go back to AA. Um, I heard it twice, and it, my hair standing up on the back of my neck. The voice said, don't do this, go back to AA. Same voice. Don't know if it was in here or out here. I just heard it. It freaked me out. I set the quart of beer down and I looked under the bed to see if there was anything under there <laughs> and realized I was in this little garage, this little efficiency apartment by myself. And I made myself sick and I laid down on the side of the bed and I said, okay, I'm going to do this. And the next day, next morning, I heard the voice one last time. And, and I got up and I called the doctor and got some doggy downers, and I went to work, because that's what you do when you're that close. You don't work, you're on the street. And I went to work for my brother and didn't tell him much what was going on. I don't remember if I ever told him I was going to AA that night or not, but at 6 o'clock that night, I got out of my truck in the back of an AA meeting. I parked in the back because I didn't want anybody to know that I was going back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was humiliated that I was going back. You pick up a couple of desire chips, guys, and it's kind of embarrassing to come back. I hear people all the time, I'm afraid to come back. You pick up a couple of hundred of them, And I walked in the back door of that AA meeting and these people were laughing their butts off. And I don't know what they were laughing about still to this day, but I knew it was about me. And, um, 
And I got about halfway in, and they were all smoking cigarettes like they did in the day, you know, six cigarettes out of, you know, they, all of them. <laughs> I tell you, I'm an ex-smoker, and we screwed it up for all the new little guys coming up. We used to be able to smoke in meetings. How cool was that? And we screwed it up for you. I apologize. Walked into this thing, and uh, they were laughing, and I was feeling really unconscious and self-conscious, and just I was detoxing. And my head started saying, "You know, Chris, this is you're pushing this. You know, let's let's go home and get some sleep, and then tomorrow you can." I wasn't going to come. I was going to leave. And this little old girl got between me and the door, and hooked her finger in my belt loop, and uh, set me down in a chair, wouldn't let me up, and uh, I'll never forget her. She, uh, Turned out her sponsor had seen me across the room, couldn't get to me, and she pointed, and the little girl came and got. Y'all know how God works. We were laughing about this last time I talked over in Houston. If it had been an old guy like this, I mean, I'd have just whipped his butt. You know, you don't touch me because I'm, I'm leaving. I'm done. But this little girl snags her finger and says, sit down, cowboy, you know, and she, she sets me down in a chair. This little girl wasn't off in some little young adult meeting talking about young adult stuff. She was in mainstream AA doing what she was supposed to be doing, helping another drunk that was hurting. And, buddy, you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to see that I was hurting. She sat me down, got a roll of paper towels, and they got some coffee and helped start. Every time I'd pick it up, I'd spill it and they'd clean it up. It just, they're laughing, and I'm finally relaxes a little bit. And the chairperson sees me, and he knows me up from North Texas, and he says he takes charge of the meeting. Imagine this. The, get, get this. The chairperson actually takes charge of the meeting. Oh. <laughs> Breathtaking. You got a crappy old open discussion where we're going to talk about your stupid weed eater one more time. And this guy sees that they got a newcomer in there, so he says, Hey, why don't we do something different? Let's talk about how our lives are different as a result of working the 12 steps. What a topic! And they did, folks. They went around the room and they talked about getting their credit cards back, and they talked about getting jobs, and they talked about getting their health back, and they talked about the cool stuff wasn't some stupid just like gratitude meeting. It was just they were pulling me with a vision. They were telling me the truth about what happened in their life as a result of working the 12 steps, not as a result of going to 90 meetings in 90 days. They gave me one simple message. I don't want to offend anybody here, guys, but we have way too many people out there mixing this message up. Before I run out of time, I mean, i got to say it. Alcoholics Anonymous does their fair share of confusing the issue. We came up with a, with a, with a textbook, and this is the book we were supposed to be using. But we've done nothing in the last 75 years except continue to print literature that further confuses the message. Just, just reading a book coming across uh, uh, from San Antonio today, the little beginner's book, Grapevine, just produced, little just published. I'm only up to the first 35 stories, but the first 35 stories mention the steps five times. Yeah, that's what I said. Wow, I can't wait to finish this. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Some of you guys, you got sober just going to meetings and just showing up. I understand that. But some knuckleheads in this room like this that are the real McCoy, they're not going to get sober doing that. Why are we telling them that that's an option? Why don't we tell them the truth? Why don't we stop walking on eggshells around alcoholics' tender little feelings? I'll tell you what happened to me. At the end of the meeting, the old geezer came up and he said, Chris, are you done? Would you like to stop for good, not one day at a time, for good? Some of you are shaking your head like, I'm sorry. The big book doesn't say that we offer the new guy today. The big book doesn't say that. It says we have a daily reprieve, that means every day. It's completely different. We take it out of context. I know other AA literature, like Grapevine stuff, says one day at a time. I understand that. The book says we live life one day at a time. That's what we do. Y'all understand that? Man, I don't know. I'm going to get up in the morning, and I'm going to ask God to guide my life tomorrow because I don't know what's coming down the pike. But, guys, I'm on good, solid ground. And the book told me, as long as I continue to do this work, that I'm going to stay sober the rest of my life. The Tenth Step Promises promises me permanent sobriety. As long as I continue to stay spiritually fit. He explained that to me and I said yes. And he hugged my neck. And the next day they were back on my doorstep making sure I made it back to the meeting. And after the meeting we got in the back and he said, Chris, do you have a problem with this God business? Absolutely not. 
When I'm eating out of dumpsters in Houston, Texas, I knew that there was a God. I don't have a problem with God. I just don't feel his contact. I don't feel his presence. I have no access. He says, I know that. That's why you're drinking. Would you like to gain access? Yes. Here, let me explain the third step prayer to you. And we got on our knees and did a third step prayer. Boom. We got up and went to lunch, came back, gave me a notebook and says, Here, why don't we start writing a little thing called a fourth step? Right away. The book says we launched out on a course of vigorous action. People in here grinding their teeth. I couldn't do a fourth step until I was eight months sober. You must have been one sick son of a gun. <laughs> People come up and they want to talk about it. Say, Chris, you make this sound like it's a race. Let me tell you something. If the obsession to use comes back to me, I'm going to use. It is a race. We need to get spiritually connected. Bill Wilson's in Towns Hospital on his ninth, tenth day in Towns Hospital. He's, he, when he has his barn-burning spiritual experience. Dr. Bob did a little steps in a little less than two weeks. These have barn-burning spiritual experience. They never drank again. But we're going to tell a little newcomer coming in the back door that you can take as long as you want to work the steps. Why? Why? Do you know what that translates to? Yeah. This is what it means. When I tell you that you can take your time, it means I don't have time to mess with you right now. Let's call a spade a spade. There's a race here, guys. I don't care how you work the steps. People want to split hairs with me all the time. You want to, is this a two-part or is this a three-part disease? We want to do a, th- a third-column inventory, a four-column inventory, an expanded eight-column inventory. I could give a rat's butt. Whatever your sponsor says do, do. The, the people that are relapsing, folks, are not people that are working the steps incorrectly. They're the people that are not working the steps at all. I got to go. Golly. I'm, two weeks later, I've had a spiritual experience. I'm sitting on the tailgate of my truck. I'm fixing to dump a fist step with my sponsor when he gets back into town. And I'm sitting there realizing that I've been a victim all my life. And all of a sudden, I realize I'm free. And the obsession, I'm surrounded by liquor stores, and I don't want to drink. I'm by myself, and I don't want to drink. What, a, what, a, what, a, what an experience. There's two things I'll never forget. Pokey pokey the first time. <laughs> and that spiritual experience freaks me out. I got back and these guys got around me and they said, Buddy, we're going to keep you busy. Y'all need to understand. They weren't letting me sit in these meetings and getting quiet and getting all comfortable. They had me answering the phone. We're going to talk about this stuff tomorrow. They had me vacuuming the carpet. They had me active in the fellowship. They didn't have me sitting on my butt. You can't do anything until you've been sober six months. Would you stop killing people with that crap? We don't all agree with that. Why do you think we've got these little nice little guys out here signing sheets? Give them something to do. Get them out of their head. Let them be busy. Empty that garbage can. Clean this up. Could I do it? Of course. We need to let the newcomer do something. You find a job in AA, you'll stay. You don't find a job in AA, you ain't going to stay. You'll end up like the people back in that hospital with long-term sobriety losing it. Because that's what we're seeing. Unbelievable. People want to say, oh, Chris, those people, they sounded so mean. If my sponsor talked to me like that, don't get me. Listen, folks, love comes in lots of different forms, but you need to understand this. Love is not telling me everything I want to hear. The opposite of love is not hate. It's apathy. We've got way too much of that in our fellowships. I want you here, but I don't want to mess with you. But you see, the greatest gift I can do is to mess with you. The greatest gift I can do is to come up next to you and talk to you about this thing called a spiritual experience and get you excited about recovery. And I'm going to get you solid, and then we're going to go find another one, and then another one, and another one. And that's what we do. This only works if you do something, folks. There's two things that kills alcoholics. Long-term sobriety is extinguished by entitlement and complacency. Isn't it the truth? I'm 21 years sober. You clean the toilet. You go do the H&I. Sitting at our group conscience the other day, looking for a new GSR, an alternate GSR. Everybody's sitting around like, nope, not me. No, not me. Who got to be the alternate GSR? The newest little guy in there. Where's all the old timers? 
Entitlement, complacency. I said it a minute ago in this hospital where I work. We used to see one or two, we'd see somebody come back in with 10 or 15 years of sobriety, 20 years of sobriety. Every once in a while they'd come back in. And we'd ask them, you know, what happened and what happened. I've got to tell you something now, guys. I bet you in that hospital right now I've got 20, 25 people that had 10 years or more of sobriety. Members that stopped doing the work. I need, a, I, need a, I need to coin a phrase for you. It's called untreated alcoholism. You think coming to a few meetings and coming to pick up your chip is going to treat alcoholism. But the book says working the 12 steps, that's what gets me connected spiritually. And part of the 12 steps is working. All those old geezers that come back, the men and women that come back, I ask them the question. I've been asked not to, but I do it anyway. I've got to tell you. Because I ask them the quick point. But hey, let me ask you a question. Mr. 17 years and lost it, tangled up in the medications one more time. Let me ask you a question. How many people were you sponsoring? None. So let me see if I can get straight in this book where it says that I get a free ride. Everybody sponsors, folks. Everybody works with newcomers. That's what we do. I can hear it now all over, all over Houston, not in Denny's. Well, that little guy, he was one preachy some bitch. I guarantee you that. He just... <laughs> I can, I can do this any way I want. Yeah, you can. But here's the excitement part. Here's the deal. My sponsor always asks me to ask you guys. He asks me all the time, Chris, how's that working for you? Now, I spent seven years in Alcoholics Anonymous doing it the way some of y'all are doing it, my way, taking seven pills a day when I tried to commit suicide. Not working real well for you, is it, huh, buddy? At the end of a suicide attempt, I walked back in the doors, and the old guys said, buddy, you want what we got? You want to know what we got? We got happiness. We got peace. We got some power, a sense of direction. You want some of that? Yeah, I think I might like a little bit of that. <laughs> so let me put it in another way that you can understand it. You want a new car? You want to buy a house? You want to go back to school? That's what we ought to be talking about in our meetings, folks. Not the stupid weed eater. I was talking to some buddies about this the other day. I'm going to mention it to you. My, uh, I was a member of a couple of groups up in North Texas when I finally got sober. I was sober about six months, and I was over at this other group, and there was an old geezer in there, a guy named ML, and he was, he was sober a long time. He was pushing 30 years when I was there, and, and uh, he's since passed away, but a uh, nice old guy. And I'm helping him after the meeting. I'm picking up coffee cups and stuff and just... My social calendar, you know what I mean, guys, is just like there's nothing happening in my life. And, and uh, uh, I couldn't get a date with two pockets of cocaine. And um, <laughs> I, it's just not good. And I, I, but this old geezer was sitting there, and this guy's 30 years, pushing 30 years, and he's washing the cups, and I'm bringing the cups to him, and we're dumping them out in the ashtrays and stuff and back in the day. And, and, uh, and he, I remember him that night, and we were alone in the place, and the people had turned the lights out in the back, and just in the kitchen is the lights. And he turns around, and he's got old glasses like this, and he turns around, and he's got a towel, and he, he's wiping his, his, uh, his uh, glasses like this. And I look up, and his eyes are glistening like that. Because we've been talking about the program, and I'm, I'm all wrapped up about this little guy, and this, he's be talking to me about sponsoring him, and, and this guy's encouraging me to go get this guy, you know, go help him. And he, we're just talking recovery, and he turns around, and he's got tears in his eyes. And he said, buddy, I just need to tell you, I love you, and we need you here in Alcoholics Anonymous. We need you here at this group. I can't tell it without crying. I remember 14 years old, I'm sitting over there where Myers and I were raised, out on Goat Creek Road, and um, I'm sitting at a picnic table, and brother and sister and everybody else is gone, dad, I don't know, I'm out there by myself, and you know that southern wind coming down across the gulf, and and I'm sitting out there by myself in a big old full moon, and I am so sad. I am so uncomfortable. I'm 14 years old, guys. I'm three years away from my first drink, and I'm coming undone. I feel so useless. The, the symptoms of the untreated alcoholism are already kicking my butt. Everybody thinks the alcohol is the problem. That, shit, that was the solution, buddies. And I'm coming undone. And I remember setting a prayer that night. I'm looking at that big old full moon, and I swear I ain't making it up. I looked at, God, I looked at that moon, and I said, God, all I want in this world is to feel useful. Fast forward, 1987, and this old man looks at me and says, we need you. I've got to tell you guys, 
That's a million, a million, a million times better than keep coming back. It works if you work it. Ah, <laughs> oh, I hate that term. Because that gives me permission to leave. Some of you like it. It gives me permission to leave. And I've got to tell you something, folks. At our AA group, we, we don't do that. At the end of the Lord's Prayer, we say, stay. And then we go get us a drunk to work with. That's what this is about. Permanent sobriety. It's not about relapsing every 20 minutes. You do the work. You have a spiritual experience. You're going to get well. I'm winding it down. Let me tell you something, folks. Every person in this room, if you're a big book thumper and you've stood around and took the heat and been taking a ridicule because you're carrying a big book in the meetings, I'm going to tell you this. The little one-eyed guy from the podium is going to thank you personally for staying in the trench and helping us carry the clear, undiluted message of Alcoholics Anonymous without all the cycle babble and all the nonsense that goes with it. If you're a woman in here and you've stayed in this fellowship, I want to personally thank you for staying in this fellowship. I want for for bearing witness to the fact that you can get married and have kids and still sponsor people. And that you don't have an easy out because you happen to have a family. The pressure on women is unbelievable. The pressure to, 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 to not stay in this fellowship. And we need you. All over the world, women are dying. That lots of women still in AA. They know the best price at Bed Bath & Beyond, but they can't tell you how to finish a fourth step. <laughs> Did I say that? For every one of you young people in this room, you little young guys, little 19, 20, 21, you little young collegiate age guys, and you've come to this fellowship, let me tell you this. We need you. You are wanted here. You are needed here. We are not going to tell you that you can't help anybody because you're too young. You don't have young adult alcoholism. You have the same disease that's killing me. And you can get sober at 20 just as easy as we got sober at 35 or 40. It ain't going to get any better. We need everybody in here. Say it and close. The big book says over in Bill's story, it says each in our own way are going to carry the message of hope to the newcomer. And that's what makes this program so powerful. You're not going to carry the message the way I do. Some of you can can relate to what I'm saying, and I can touch some of you. And some of you, it's a very gentle, quiet voice of somebody nice sitting behind you that's going to carry the message to you. I don't know who you're going to hear it from, but open your mind to the fact that it might be from a 20-year-old. It might be from somebody that's maybe not the same color, same gender, God's going to use every single person in this room. You just got to suit up and show up and ask for your marching orders, and I guarantee you God will show you what to do. And I'm so honored to be here. Thank you, guys.